And you're tuned into Just Peace. You're tuned into Just Peace right here on WRFG. And I'm your co host, co producer, Cliff Albright. And joined by Heather Gray. Yes, thank you so much, Cliff. I'm just uh, really looking forward to the discussion we're going to be having tonight. We do have on the line Umema Jaffrey who is the wife of Ibrahim Muhammad, who has been in prison for two years. We're going to learn about this case. She has been this remarkable writer about what's been happening with her husband and her family. And I'm so appreciative of the great work that she's done. Umayma, are you there? Hi, Heather. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, it's just a pleasure. So I'm going to ask, before we talk about your husband and his case, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background. Um, born and raised in Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm a Texan through and through. I've been um, you know, a mom for 10 years, a wife for 11 years, um, a mom, I mean, a daughter and a sister for 34 years. So uh, I'm a stay-at-home mom right now, raising four kids on my own. In, four kids, uh, yeah, Ohio. right. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, I was just going to say we're in Northwest Ohio in, in Toledo. So you, you've been actually, you've been moving around in a lot of different cities with what's been happening with your husband. I know we'll get into some of that, but yeah, so you're in Toledo right now, and that's where your husband yeah. is in prison, I believe. So, all right, so... Now, you wrote this remarkable article in, it was published in Muslim Matters on November the 6th, 2017. I was so impressed mm -hmm. with your expressions and your, you know, just telling this story about what happened to your husband and your family. So tell us about the article. Tell us about that um, article. You know, I wrote, I wrote this, I like to call it a story versus an article. Yeah, right. Um, it is a story. True. <laughs> it's basically the story of, um, how in 2011, you know, our family woke up one morning and we were raided by the FBI. And, you know, it goes into great detail of what happened that morning and what happened subsequently. And then shortly thereafter, you know, how my husband spoke with the, with the government. And then it was, it was a long four years of just silence. And then all of a sudden, and where we moved on with our life, frankly. And then in 2015, out of nowhere, um, my husband was arrested. Yeah, just remarkable. So what what has been the, respon the response to you writing this? And I need to say also that you wisely have a petition uh, that's circulating around the country as well. Yes, yeah. At the end of that story, story, we linked a petition. And, you know, when I posted that, I posted it just 36 hours before my husband's second bond hearing was to occur. And, you know, honestly, I didn't expect, I didn't even expect 100 signatures. But in 24 hours, we were greatly surprised and humbled that over 9,000 people from around the world signed that petition. Yeah. And now it's up to 14,000 or so, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's More than 14,000 at this point. I can't remarkable. It's humbling. Yeah. Well, it also demonstrates that people are really concerned about this kind of thing and what happened to your, your husband and your family. So, uh, so the response has been quite remarkable. What, and what kind of support have you received from the Muslim community itself? You know, the Muslim community has been very supportive. We have people who have a platform to speak who are sharing our story. We have, I have people who are emailing me and just, you know, sending their prayers and their kind words. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a really great response. It's, yeah. it's beautiful. It's touching. I guess that's been true with the non-Muslim community as well, to a degree, right? Um, you know, it's not, it's not a new case like this that's come to the Muslim community. But, you know, it's, it's, I guess you could say, something newer, you know, that's happened in the past couple of years. And so people are, 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 I guess, surprised that it's still occurring in the Muslim community, that people are still being targeted and, and, and you know, being called terrorists. Um, and so I guess for that fact that this can still happen is still surprising to people. Umayma, let me just ask you, were you, you were raised a Muslim, right? Is that correct? Yes. Yes, you're raised yes. a Muslim. So your 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 parents, your family, they're all Muslim. Yes, yes. We're yeah. Right, right. So your husband has a remarkable background. So let's talk about him. What's his background? My husband is actually an immigrant. 
um, he was born and raised in Sharjah, which is a small city outside of Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. And at the age of 11, he moved to India, and um, he did his, I guess, higher education there. And then in 2001, he moved to um, to the U.S. to do his master's in engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And then, you know, in 2005, we met. In 2006, we got married. Um, and 2006 was actually when we when we moved to Toledo, Ohio. And he's, you know, since then, he's been a stellar uh, member of the community, um, which is why, you know, people have stood behind us so relentlessly through all of this, because they know him as a, as a you know, stand-up community member. He has no criminal history. He loves his family, like his kids are his entire world. And he's he's always gone out of his way to help people in the community. And, you know, that's I guess that's why I kind of do love it here. You know, even though I'm here for not the best reasons, I still love the community here for, for supporting us. Oh, that's wonderful. So your husband's degree was in what? Engineering. He did a, a degree in civil engineering. And his work has been in engineering, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, he got... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You tell an interesting story in your article, I think, about elephants, about the elephant. Could you tell, <laughs> tell, tell us about We're going yeah. to go into more, more of your article, but tell us about the elephant story. <laughs> so, um, you know, the Toledo Zoo is actually this really beautiful zoo um, in the city. It's actually, at one point, I, I don't remember what year, but it was voted number one zoo in America. Um, so I would recommend you visit it. So when they had a new elephant enclosure, the the engineers who who basically built it sent it to my husband's company for inspection and for design. And so my husband actually worked on an enclosure that now houses, I think, uh, four elephants um, in the Toledo Zoo. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> All right, so that you, you know, it's just hard to know where to begin with this. But okay, so t- he he is in what jail right now? He's in Lucas County Correctional Center, which is just a county jail in downtown. So I'd like to just ask how in the world he ended up in that jail, in that Lucas County jail. What's the history Um, here? Well, um, so it is a long story. 2011, we were raided, you know, like I said, by the FBI. And at that point, you know, they handed my husband a subpoena to stand in front of a grand jury. And at this point, he was not charged with anything at all. And when we hired our lawyer, he was able to speak with the government, with the prosecutors, and basically they um, they retracted that subpoena, and instead they offered a reverse proffer. And a reverse proffer is where you sit down with the government and you're willing to cooperate, but they get to speak first. So instead of going into this, this dark room or this mysterious case where it's like, I don't know what information you want, they went ahead and told them what they knew about X, Y, Z. And at that point, my husband's like, he really didn't have anything to offer because he didn't know anything about whatever it is they were investigating at that time. He reverse proffered with them twice. He cooperated. Um, you know, our attorney even followed up with them. And they were like, I guess, it just seemed like they weren't interested. And they never, they said they would contact us. Like, contact us again, and they never did. And so for four years, we didn't hear anything, not even a cricket. And, um, you know, we moved to Michigan even for two years, and we made sure to run it by our attorney just so everybody knows we're moving. You know, we're not running away. We have nothing to hide. Um, Even when we moved to Dallas, Texas, we made sure everybody knew where we were going because, again, like I said, we had nothing to hide. In that meantime, in that... um, in that in term, you know, my husband even applied for his U.S. citizenship. You know, we were doing everything that a normal American family was doing with a growing family. Right, right. Let me just ask you, Umema, uh, and again, I want our listeners to know that we're talking with Umema Jaffrey. We're talking about her husband, her husband's case, and what's been happening with her family. Her husband is Ibrahim Muhammad, is in prison right now. We're going to get into more of those circumstances, but I think first we're going to take a quick You know, the first time that the family came in 2011, uh, not the family, the FBI came in 2011 to your house, I think you asked them for a warrant. Isn't that correct? And they didn't offer you a warrant? No, I was blue in the face asking for a warrant. Yeah. As soon as they got in the house, I was like, I want a warrant. I want a warrant. 
And, you know, unfortunately at that time, at that time and even before, you know, a lot of Muslim families were getting raided. And so, you know, you had organizations like CARE teaching Muslim families, you know, about their rights. I see. The FBI knocks on your door. So we were aware of that. So as soon as they entered our house, I was like, I need a warrant. And they were like, sure, you know, we'll get it to you. But six hours later, I was still harping about the warrant, and they were still like, we'll get it to you. And so we never really got the warrant until, like I said, six or seven hours after they searched our entire house for that long. It was upon leaving that they handed us the, the warrant. Wow. That seems strange to me, actually. Um. <laughs> it, it was very strange, but you know what? What's even stranger is the fact that there was a condition on that warrant that said they didn't have to present it until they left. Really? Yeah. So I'd like to know more about the law on that issue, but the thing is they went in and, and your house was just a wreck after they had, they looked at everything oh, yeah. in your house, right? They, everything, absolutely. Into the refrigerator, yeah. food, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know what anybody would hide in the refrigerator. Um, but yeah, I had two, I had two toddlers at the time and a little baby, you know, they went through the diaper bag, you know, even unopened diaper, you know, brand new diaper boxes we had, they opened those. Um, you know, they go through, you know, your sock drawer, under your mattresses, closets, boxes, I mean, you name it, it's open. And, they, and they took your laptop computers? Yeah, they took our laptop. I think we had um, some hard drives. We had um, something kind of like a, 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 I guess, an iPod. Every, any, anything electronic, they took it. So, uh, and they took photos that you had of your children on one of the... The CDs. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, like, you know, your memory gets full on your laptop and your memory gets full on your phone. So we would back up all our pictures right. on this hard drive, and they took that hard drive. And to this day, that's the only thing I want back, because it has everything from when my first born. Exactly. You know, and exactly. this world. Exactly. Wow. Have, have, well, let me just ask you, have you requested that information from them? Or no? Or no? Um, you know, only through our attorney, you know, after we did the proffers and everything. Right. Uh, we asked them, like, when do we get our stuff back? And, you know, honestly, keep everything. We just want that hard drive. And even if you want to keep the hard drive, just give us a copy of the pictures. And they actually said that we'll get those to you in a couple of weeks. And that, how many years has it been? It's been six years. Wow. All right. So your husband has been incarcerated for how long now? Actually, um, he's been detained. Because he's not convicted of a crime, he's detained at county jail. You know, it's it's been two years, so just just up above two years. All right, so let's go back to some of these arrests here. First of all, the FBI came to your house when you were in Ohio. Is that correct? Yes. In Ohio in 2011. And then ultimately you were in Dallas, and this was four years later the FBI came again. And that's when they arrested your husband, or detained yes, him, came, as you're saying, detained. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the U.S. Marshals came. The U.S. Marshals so, came. Oh, it was, yeah. it was different than the FBI. Okay, the U.S. Marshals came. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they come on the orders of the FBI, and then this time when I demanded a warrant, they actually gave me one. So this is where you begin. This is uh, your art. The name of your the article in the in Muslim Matters is entitled "The Day My Husband Fell," and he was so stunned that the marshals came that day. I guess he just he just didn't know what to make of it. So tell us what happened, because it's your son who keeps describing this, right? Because he yeah. was what he was what two years old at the time. Is that right? Not even. Not even two. Not even two yet. Two so yeah. how old was he again? How old was he? Um, how old is he right now? How old was your son at that time? Um, he was not two years. He, uh, my husband was arrested in November, and my, hus- my son was to turn two in December. Wow. So what, what ha- tell us about what happened then when the um, marshals came. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, there's a pattern here. Like we're in the morning, they showed up to raid our house in 2011, uh, while we're getting ready for work in school, so the same thing happened in Dallas when my husband opened the garage mm-hmm. to put out the trash. Mm-hmm. He was holding our toddler at the time. Mm-hmm. And, like, I can't, des- it's really hard to describe, but these men just stormed in. 
you know, and they were very loud, and they were like, don't move, and, you know, and then I remember just, just rushing out of my bedroom because I heard the, the noise in the garage, and I didn't even have my, my hijab, my headscarf on. I just, I ran, and I just remember my husband was actually calm, and he calmly placed our toddler in my arms, and then the U.S. Marshals, you know, that's when I was like, I want the warrant, we were just talking, um, and they were actually very calm. They were very calm. They weren't, um, they didn't put my husband in cuffs immediately, but they were, I, I, you know, honest, I remember counting the cars as they drove away, but I didn't count the number of men. But the number of men in my garage were a lot, let's just say that. And there were 14, were, 14 cars, is that right? 14? Four, yeah, 14 cars. 14 as they drove cars. Away, I, I, drew, I counted all of them, and one was actually a local, um, I guess you can say a, a Dallas police I patrol see. car. I see, I see. So, yeah, so they just, you know, they gave us the warrant, and they're like, he's to be arraigned at this and this court at this time, and you need to come like this. And and then all of a sudden, I heard a thud. You know, and my husband was on the ground, and um, it literally looked like somebody poured a bucket of water, water on him. He was sweating so profusely. Wow. And he was shaking, and he was a little incoherent. And they called, you know, they called the paramedics right away, and a fire truck and a, you know, ambulance showed up. So, you know, it was just, it was daunting, to say the least. So, I know this has not been an easy process for all of you. Um, so, now, there are two other fellows who are being detained as well. So, who are they? So, basically, this case in, uh, involves four defendants total. Oh, four. And they're, yeah, and they're two sets of brothers. So it's my husband and his brother and another pair of brothers. I see. And um, we um, we had managed to have Ibrahim's brother severed from the case. So he was tried completely separately, and these three defendants are to be tried separately. His brother pled out over the summer, and he was just sentenced uh, a few weeks ago. And the other two defendants also await trial. They're both, I think, uh, Columbus, Ohio natives. Um, and one brother actually lived in Columbus at the time of his arrest. So they extradited him to Toledo right away where, I guess, because he was able to act fast and he was local, um, he got bond right away. So he's actually been home under house arrest for the past two years. And his brother was extradited from Dubai because that's where he was residing at the time of his arrest. And he is at the fifth floor of county jail, and my husband's on the sixth floor. So they're together in the same jail. Are they able to see each other at all? No, no, no. They're um, deliberately separated yeah. um, because the defendants aren't allowed to speak to each other. I see. So let's talk about the jail, about the conditions of, of your husband's incarceration, such as food and visitation and so forth, and movement um, within the jail. You see in isolation? Well, you see in isolation? No, thankfully he's not. Thankfully he's not. Okay. Um, but just like any other jail or federal prison or state prison, um, this jail is overcrowded and underfunded. So he's on the sixth floor, um, and the fifth and sixth floor, to my understanding, are reserved for, you know, the hardened criminals, quote-unquote. And um, so my husband, you know, he's, he's, he's out of his element. You know, um, he's, he has no criminal history. He's, he's actually a very soft-spoken, nice man, and it's it's hard for him to be in a place where, you know, everything's so different. But we're allowed to visit him once a week, and I can only take one child with me. I have four children, and we get to talk to him on this fuzzy video screen in the lobby of the jail while he sits up on the sixth floor in another room. And that's how we, that's how we talk, where I can barely see him, and he can barely see me, and we basically watched his children grow through that, that hazy screen. So when he's been, he's been in jail all this time, and you've never been able to actually see him? Um, only in court. You know, if we have a pretrial or something and he's in the courtroom, then I'll come, you know, I'll obviously attend those, those pretrials. And so that's when I get to see him in person and maybe wave from afar. Wow. Um, Umayma, why do you think your husband is not getting his due process? You know, that's, that's, that's a loaded question. So, I mean, to put it simply, I can just say, you know, he, he's Muslim. You know, it's 2017. It's, um, 
you know, how many, uh, for a Muslim man, um, you know, or anybody of color, for that matter, to be in our justice system is something that is, um, it's daunting. Um, because you can almost guarantee that anybody who is a minority will not get a fair day in court. And we've seen this time and time again um, with African Americans and how they're dealt with in court versus somebody who's white. Um, we see this time and time again where, you know, uh, a white guy will enter court and get a lesser s- sentence for the same crime committed by somebody of color. Right. Um, we, we see it time and time again when a white person can go and kill people at a school or Planned Parenthood or at a concert, and he's labeled a lone wolf or somebody who's mentally ill. But somebody who's Muslim, whether a crime is committed or not, is labeled a terrorist. There, there's no fairness. There's no equality there. And for people, for people of color, they suffered this type of racism. And I think at the, at the crux of the problem is that this is about race. Or it's about, you can say religion, too, because he's Muslim and he follows the religion of Islam. But we see it in so many other people, in so many other aspects. Um, in World War II, you know, it was the Japanese who were public enemy number one. And they were put, Japanese Americans were placed in internment camps. And then after that, in the 60s, it was the Red Scare. <coughs> you know, the Russians were the enemy. And Castro in Cuba was the communist that was public no- enemy number one. And now, post to 9-11... It's the, it's the Muslim guy, you know, it's the brown guy with the beard who's public enemy number one. So that's definitely yeah. one of the reasons. Is there any other reason? Do you know why he was arrested? I mean, he was charged. Um, you know, he was charged with um, conspiracy to provide material support to terrorists. He was charged with obstruction of justice. He was charged with obstruction to commit bank fraud. And if you if you actually look at the facts of the case, and um, actually, to be honest, you know, at the bond hearing that we just had a couple of weeks ago, the prosecution themselves said, you know, there's no smoking gun. There's no evidence linking Ibrahim Muhammad to any act that was committed. But it's the fact that maybe he would have committed something or maybe he will commit something when he's out on bond. There's nothing concrete. Right. How do we know, how do we know at what point, what point do we draw the line and say, this is all innuendos, this is all inference stacking, can you please provide the proof? That's a that's a um, great point that you're making, and actually you kind of touch on that in the article that you wrote, and I even think it's worth sharing a little bit of that, where you talk about this this common story that gets that gets created. We'll share a little bit about that when we get back, but first we've got to do a, quick, a couple of quick announcements. You're listening to Just Peace right here on WRFG. We'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. And you're back, and again, you're listening to Just Peace right here on WRFG. I'm co-host, co-producer Cliff Albright, joined by co-host, co-producer Heather Gray. And our guest, um- Umayma, you still there with us? Yes, I am. Okay, great. And just right before we went to the break, you were talking about why, you know, what we've what we've seen happening with the Muslim community and, and these kinds of arrest and when in your article which we're going to post on our Facebook page again that's facebook.com slash just peace WRFG I'm gonna have the link there but in your article you talk about you know this this common pattern in the scene that you described earlier with the police the FBI the marshals coming to get your husband or some other member of the Muslim community and you, you compare it to um, at one point, I think you compare it to Agatha Christie's story that you kind of, you know, you, you get used to reading the same genre and seeing the same motifs. But I'm going to read just a little bit. You say it's the same with these types of FBI cases. If you haven't seen the pattern yet, it's only because you haven't read enough of them. The FBI authors many cases, which you may have heard about in the news as quote unquote terror plots. They are of their own construction. They involve undercover agents claiming to be sympathetic to a Muslim cause, preying on the sentiments of people who are mentally ill or alone and vulnerable or else angry and frustrated with American injustices abroad. The agents seek out vulnerable targets and then construct a plot so flimsy it could never have taken off anyway. They involve targets in the plot just enough so they can later arrest them, indict them, and convict them of a crime they never would have thought of were it not for the FBI itself. 
Often there are co-conspirators that the FBI somehow manages to rope into the case because of their association to a target, even if the co-conspirators are clueless about any potential crime. Sometimes these cases are thought, thought crimes. The defendant's guilty of nothing. Their First Amendment rights don't clearly protect. Whatever the version of the story it is, the underlying mechanism is the same. The FBI schemes and then declares itself hero as it foils its own plot. A Muslim or groups, groups of Muslims is caught in a crossfire of flimsy evidence. A jury made up of average Americans who are mass-fed fear, already exposed to a narrative of the defendant's guilt through the media, is expected to weigh in on a genre they know nothing about. They haven't read enough stories to see the pattern mm -hmm. yet. That's, I mean, that's a powerful, that's a powerful observation that you make, and you're, and and you're saying that you know this is, this is something that folks within the Muslim community have basically gotten used to over the years, at least since since nine eleven. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, that's true. So we talked earlier about you know the case and and the, you know the the trial date and all that stuff, but you know we want to talk a little bit. Um, we got a couple of questions that just kind of relate to the the human side, you know, the impact that that all of this this narrative that you were just describing. So tell us, you know, how how have you been surviving financially? You know, I just it's support from family and friends who have who have you know showed up, and I don't have to worry about a thing because I'm just so blessed to have them in in my life and my children's life. Well, that's, that's a blessing. Definitely a blessing. Definitely it's, it's a blessing. It's a huge blessing, yeah. I do want to ask uh, Umema about your, you've been trying to get bond. You haven't been able to get bond for your husband, right? Um, it's it's just yeah, been exactly. so many. Go ahead, please. What, what do you want to say about that? Um, well, I just wanted to go ahead and explain. Um, please. I'm to you off. Please. Um, he was arrested in November of 2015. And we filed for our first bond, and we got our hearing in March of 2016. You know, we had about 20 or 30 letters of support. We had, um, I actually forget the number now, but I think we had 250000 or maybe even $300,000 that we raised from family and friends, um, cash. And, you know, I was supposed to be custodian, and we had a family friend who was, um, you know, basically giving his house as collateral. We had a courtroom that was overflowing with supporters. Um, like there were no more chairs, and we had to sit in the jury box or pull out chairs from the hallway. Wow. And after a very long hearing, you know, two days later, the judge still denied our bond, saying that my husband was a flight risk, that, you know, these family and friends who um, basically lent us their money for a bond, um, that he has no connection with them and that he would very likely dupe them, which is obviously completely false. I mean, these were people who, who lent us the money and were sitting in the courtroom to support my husband. You know, these are people we have known for a decade or more from the Toledo com community. You know, so it was, it, was, it was a shock to us when we were denied that bond because we were so confident that we would get it just because we had a really good case. Yeah. And then in the spring of 2017... We filed for bond again because the judge changed for other, you know, there were a lot of other circumstances, which, um, you know, honestly, I can't blame on just the prosecution or just the defense. Um, there was a lot going on with other defendants in the case, which is why the, the judges were changing. So we get a new judge, and we, we filed again, and we, we raised the money again. And this time my uncle gave his property as collateral, and even then they denied bond because they said there's no new evidence. And then we filed a third time when a third time the judge changed. And just November 8th, we had our third bond hearing. That second one actually was we, weren't, we were not granted a hearing. The judge just denied it without a hearing. So this time the, the new judge allowed us to have a hearing. And he basically said, you know, he was confident in, our, in, our, in the conditions we presented. And he, he approves of them. But he wanted to hear basically the argument of whether this was a violation of due process or not. So our attorney argued and the prosecution argued, and he said, he, the judge said basically he would come back with a decision, and it's been 12 days now that we're still waiting for him to see on that. There's not actually been a concrete charge, has there? I mean, it, there's a, a, my assumption when reading this material is that it's basically he's being accused of 
being a Muslim and studying Muslim literature and so forth. That's what it seems like um, to me. <clears throat> I mean, it's all very, you know, vague or very general or very, you know, wishy-washy. You know, when you, if you look at any other Muslim who's been charged with a crime, it's always material support to a terrorist. And in this case, I can't go into great detail uh, no, about I understand. the case. I understand. But it's like somebody was investing in a business and um, overseas, and they were like, oh, you're finding a terrorist for his uh, obstruction to commit bank fraud. Uh, his brother who plot out, you know, was basically doing some sort of credit card fraud. And it's either my husband's guilty by association because it's his brother, or we just don't know why that charge is on yeah, my husband. Yeah, right, right. I understand. You know, it's like yeah. nothing, like nothing happened with our bank account kind of thing, and no money passed through our hands. So it's like, why do we have this charge? Yeah. It's hard, it's it's hard to know how to defend yourself when you don't really know what you're being charged for. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, you know, the government comes to you and they're like, we have FISA. <laughs> Um, or we have SIPA, where it's like, you know, they have uh, confidential information, and we can't, we can't disclose it. So yeah, it's okay. left in the dark. So, Umayma, tell us about the effect this has had on your four children. Oh, gosh. You know, initially it was very, very, very difficult. When he was, you know, arrested, I, I rushed them off upstairs, the three older children. I was like, you know, they were getting ready for school, and they heard the records downstairs as well, so naturally they were curious. I... I told them to go upstairs, and I was like, you know, don't come down. But unfortunately, they saw from the window, they saw an ambulance arrive. They saw a fire truck arrive when my husband basically blacked out. And then when he left, they were just kind of like, where's Baba, and what just happened? So they saw him, you know, being cuffed and put into an unmarked car and drive away, and they were completely confused. They were very young. And, you know, initially we had to deal with a lot of meltdowns and a lot of tantrums. And, you know, kids, when they don't know how to deal with their emotions, that's how they react. They react with a tantrum because they don't know what these emotions are. You know, confusion and, and sadness and grief. And two years later, you know, children are resilient. But even then, you know, my six-year-old, every day she draws like a dozen pictures for her dad. Every day she Oh, like does she them. really? <laughs> Good for her. Every single day. There's not a single day where she doesn't. She draws, you know, but she draws um, a number of pictures for her father. Uh, so, yeah. So yeah. is she able and to send all... them? Is she able to send them to him? Yeah, yeah. You know, I you can them. mail them. I go ahead and mail them. Yeah, Excellent. I can mail them. Excellent. Um, so Excellent. that that is, you know, that that's a blessing that we have. Oh yeah. Um, my ten year old, she's the oldest, and she was the one who I can't say for sure that she understood what happened when her father was arrested, but right. she knew something bad happened. She's yeah. the only one who cried while the other ones asked questions. I see. You know, and now she's getting older. She's a preteen. And she's like, tell me, I want to know what happened. Yeah. And how do I, like, how do I translate what happened into a 10-year-old's lingo? Like, yeah. what, what, what words do I use? What dictionary do I use to translate that so she would understand? And it's very hard because she, they have, a, they have, you know, they go to a good school. She has good friends. And I don't want to burst her bubble and say, well, we're Muslim and we are treated differently. And that's not something I've been able to bring myself to, to explain to her. Because yeah, I don't want to, to be frank. No, I could understand that. I mean, what, what would you, what on earth would you say? I don't know. That, that, so now, that's something I'd like to have more of a discussion about at some point. I know not here today, but as a parent, what on earth do you do about that? That's you know, a serious dilemma, I know. So I'm very impressed with your, with your daughter drawing these picture is good for her. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. I know you haven't been able to really spend time with your husband, of course, but what's been the impact on him? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, initially, like very initially, he was like, he just kept saying, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Don't worry about me. Yeah. You know, it was as if he was trying to comfort me, but at the same time, it was really just comforting himself. Yeah. But now, you know, it's, it's, it's feel, that feeling of helplessness, you know, for two years, just, you know, you want to you wanna bang on the walls, you want to you wanna scream at the top of your lungs saying, I'm innocent and I don't belong here, be denied bond twice, and now you're just waiting in limbo for the third bond. I mean, he's, he's naturally depressed, he's, he's feeling helpless, and it's very, very, very hard for him to, to be away from his children. 
you know, he was like, you know, I'm mom and I do everything for the kids. You need the cooking and the cleaning and the school. But, you know, he was, he was dad. He was Baba who would do all the spare hugs and the bedtime stories. And he would save them from me when I was like ready to discipline somebody and put them in timeout. Or, you know, he'd be the one sneaking cookies before dinner. He bonded very well with us. His kids are his life. They're his world. Yeah, it sounds to that way. To be away from yeah. them has been incredibly hard. Like, even if he does teach it, like, I'm able to mail him pictures every now and then. So even to see those, is just, it's too much. Uh, you know, part of him wants to see their pictures to see how they're doing, but a part of him doesn't want to because it's just too painful. I can imagine. Is your husband able to read? What can he do in the prison? What, is he able, he's... He's not able to get outside either, is that correct? Oh, um, no, no, he's not allowed to get outside. You know, it's a county jail smack dab in the middle of downtown. I see. Surrounded by other buildings. So there's no, you know how in federal prisons you might be allowed some rec time outside? Yeah. He's not allowed that. You basically go downstairs into the basement for rec. There's no wow. windows, there's no sunlight. Wow. Um, he basically asks me, well, hey, what's the weather like outside? You know, is it cloudy? Um, have the leaves fallen off the trees yet? Or, or, or simply he just watches the Weather Channel on TV. He has some movement, you know, uh, once a week. They're allowed to go to the library. And, you know, he'll read whatever he can get his hands on. He, like, he likes sci-fi. You know, he reads a lot of those. And he reads the paper every day. Um, and that's it. A lot of times he just rereads my letters or the kids' letters. Does, can he have any books or anything like that? Um, I've mailed him books. You know, okay. you can mail books um, okay. from, from any publisher, so um, they have to be soft covers, not not hard covers. So, but that's 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 also another blessing. But at least I can mail him some books. Now, your husband came from India, uh, but he is a permanent resident and or a citizen at this point. Um, he was a permanent resident. Yeah, after we uh, after we got married, you know, we applied for his green card, and yeah. he was granted that. Right, and um, you know, just. Just, uh, it's just, you know, he married a U.S. citizen, and his kids were born and raised here. Right. And so right. the natural next step was for him to apply for citizenship. And we applied um, in 2014. And 2015, when he was arrested, I think maybe just a day or two later, uh, two, uh, excuse me, a day or two later, I received a letter saying he needs to come in for his fingerprints and later his interview wow. for his wow. citizenship. So I was like, wow, we, like, just missed it. Wow. All right, so let's talk about our time is going quickly here. There's just so much to say about this case. But let's talk about what people can do. I know you have a petition. What's the status of the petition? We've mentioned that earlier now. I have sent that out. That's going to be on the the uh, Facebook page as well, right, Cliff? So what what can people do to help? They can continue liking and sharing that petition, you know, just so we can get more and more signatures. And if you go on change.org and you, you look up Free Ibrahim Now, you'll find that uh, petition. What is more important is that people are aware of cases like this. So it's not just about Ibrahim. It's about other people like him, whether they're Muslim, whether they're African American, whether they're Latino being detained, being detained by ICE. It's a lot of um, double standards that exist in our justice system. And it's 2017, and these injustices should not exist anymore. I mean, this is, this is a world our children will inherit. And we need to be aware and we need to be woke, as they say, of, of other uh, injustices happening in the world towards any minority or to any people of need of any you know, race, color, nationality, or creed. Yeah, Mabel, let me just ask you about this. I completely agree with you. And you know, the, the the issue is not being respectful of the other and not learning about different cultures and so forth, which is really uh, an important thing for all of us to be able to do. And, you know, this is one of the issues we face in the South as well, you know, just not really understanding the African influence in the Southern culture, which is huge. I mean, I always say that the South is basically African in food, music, everything. But in any case, it's not something that's necessarily being taught. So what would you recommend that those who are not Muslim read, or what should they do to learn? What recommendations can you make? Um, the first thing is, you know, when uh, if your community is having like an in-the-face dialogue, to attend that dialogue where Christian 
a church or a Muslim mosque or a Jewish synagogue is hosting an interfaith dialogue, I, I highly encourage people to attend and ask questions because that's, that's the key to education. That's the key to communication is to ask questions if you don't know something. You know, unfortunately, our, our, there's a lot of fear-mongering, there's a lot of Islamophobia, and so people are, are, are kind of brainwashed, they're kind of biased. Um, without really knowing the facts. And the best thing they do is is to ask somebody. And, you know, um, I feel really great, like, if I'm just grocery shopping and somebody just stops and they're like, excuse me, ma'am, why do you wear that hijab? Why do you wear that scarf on your head? And I'm like, thank you so much for asking questions because that is what leads to dialogue and that is what leads to respectful communication and to, and to, and to learn about each other. So what is your response? What is your response if somebody asks you that question? What do you when say? When somebody asks me that, I, yeah. you know, it's, it's very simple. You know, I am a practicing Muslim woman, and we, we cover our hair out of modesty. We cover our hair because it's been ordained by God. You know, it's not something I'm forced to wear. It's something, you know, actually at the age of 14, I just woke up one day and I wanted to wear. Right. And it's part of my identity as a Muslim woman. If I see somebody... I guess if you see a Sikh person who has a, a, a turban on their on their head or you know covering their hair, then I know that person is Sikh, and I respect their their culture. I respect their their religion. So somebody who sees me as a Muslim woman, I don't want them to think anything of me except that oh, there is a Muslim woman. Yeah. Oh, there's a, you know if you think about a nun in a church, it's like oh, there's a nun. Exactly. And automatically, people do, you know it exudes respect. It commands respect. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the issue of the nun. That's certainly true, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good point. So, Cliff, you had something you wanted to say? Well, yeah, I'm just I'm curious. You know, so in your article, you talked about the, the reality for Muslims since 9-11, right? And, and this narrative, you know, the, the, the FBI creating these stories. And I'm just curious if you've seen changes since the election last year you know has it has it been consistently the same since 9-11 or did it kind of ebb and flow and then you see kind of a a changing attitude or more intensity since the election last year um well so i mean we're all aware of the travel ban mm-hmm. right right um and the travel ban is for only certain countries why is it only for the certain countries mm-hmm. um you know we have to ask ourselves if you have an administration who's putting up this travel ban, what do they think about Muslims? And you see what happened recently in New York City, you know, with the with the U-Haul truck, or, or was it the Home Depot truck, and how that, that perpetrator was, how he was labeled, and how he was shunned, or, you know, how the administration was like, he should be hung, or he should be sent to Gitmo. And then yet you have somebody who shot 500 people at a concert. Mm-hmm. The most in on American soil um, in modern times. Exactly. And he was killed, or he shot himself. But you know, nothing negative was really said about him. Mm-hmm. The fact that Gitmo is still open, the fact that Guantanamo is still open, with men in there who have not been formally charged, for men who have been separated from their families for for fifteen years, sixteen years, you know, and they just sit there. Yeah awaiting trial and my husband is in county jail for two years still awaiting trial so the fact that the guantanamo is open even though you know we have a new administration speaks volumes the fact that we have a travel ban that people are still fighting you know we fight against it and the administration fights for it and the fact that it's going back and forth something they really really want Mm -hmm. to be in effect right it's 2017 and this really should not be happening yeah and what's it like for you balancing, and for others, you know, I don't know to what extent you've connected with other families that are in the same situation, but, you know, what's it, what's that balancing act like to, on the one hand, you're, you're dealing with, obviously, your very personal, very specific case, right? But on the other hand, you, you see this wider trend that needs voices and activisms, and, and, you know, what's it like kind of trying to deal with both of those, or, you know, is it just... And dealing with the person, you can't really get in, involved as much as you can on a broader issue. What's it like trying to balance that? Um, it's funny you ask that. You know, my attorney. Every time I get really passionate, where I'm like, this, this shouldn't be happening. This is how Muslim people are treated. He's like, look, I'm just here to fight 
the battle. Mm. I'm not a crusader. And it's only recently after a, a friend was like, you know, you should, you should voice your story. You, you should get out there. People need to know about Ibrahim. People need to know about the other defendants. People need to know that in 2017 this is still happening. And it's only recently in the past month that I, I wrote this story. I wrote these articles and this petition and that it's caught on. It caught on really fast. And so my balancing act has only just begun. And now I realize, and I've told my husband this, I was like, you know what? This isn't about you anymore. This is about everybody who faces injustice. Mm. Good. Um, yeah. and you, go ahead. And, um, I, no, sorry. I told my attorney, I was like, you know what? You go ahead and fight that battle for my husband, and I'll fight the war. Good for you. And, you know, there are a lot of activists <sighs> out there, and I'm reaching out, and I'm like, please, like, guide me, help me, because you guys have a platform. You have a voice, and, but you know Heather, your show, your amazing show that you know you voice the injustices that happen in our country. I mean, we need these platforms to make a difference. I completely um, agree. Uh, <laughs> good, good for you. I, wait, I'm interrupting you. Go ahead. What, what else did no, you want to say? No, I mean, well, you know, Cliff was asking how I balance it. <clears throat> and it's hard. You know, um, I have four kids. It's hard. I, I actually missed my older son's project, and he was devastated. He was like, I was supposed to turn in this project. Mm. And I had, to write to, I had to write a note to the teacher. And she was very understanding, and she was very sympathetic. And she was like, you know, whatever you need to make the situation easier for you and your children, we will help. Mm. So having these people, you know, these teachers, community members, anybody, even strangers who just smile in your face, it makes that task that much easier. So anyway, it was wonderful talking with um, you, Umema Jeffrey about the, the case of her husband and her work for justice. It was quite, quite remarkable, right, Cliff? D- yeah, definitely. I mean, um, <laughs> what a story! It's an incredible story, and it, both the the individual story as well as the 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 overall story um, that she was talking yeah. about. Yeah, you know that, that there's this reality that this entire community lives with of recognizing to do when the FBI comes knocking talking about a plot it's just you know it's fascinating and then the last part of what she was saying about trying to balance those things balance yeah. the individual case along with the bigger issue um, and, and, and finishing children's homework assignments at the I, same exactly time. yeah I mean, I mean it's nice also that of course she had the understanding of the teacher and I, this is one of the things that I found since Trump was elected and starting uh, trying to have all these bans from various countries and so forth. The response has been remarkable, Cliff. Mm-hmm. When I went out to the airport, when he wanted to have that travel ban, there were sizable demonstrations out here. Right. Well, around the country, but it's certainly here in Atlanta as well. Right. And many people had never done anything like this before. Definitely. So that that's encouraging as well. Right. So if you want more information, again, we've posted all the links on our Facebook page. And again, it's facebook.com slash justpeacewrfg, Peace. WRFG, and you can get the link to Umayma's article and the uh, petition and a couple other things on there. So check it out and get informed.